used by plant biologists for a number of reasons. One is because it can complete its life cycle in a relatively short time for a plant, 30 to 40 days. Uh, the life cycle of a plant, uh, depending upon what variety they use, involves really a plant of very small stature. So you can grow a large number of these plants in a relatively small space. And given the um, uh, proper conditions, have them complete their life cycle. That is, you put a seed in the tube and uh, throughout the life cycle of the plant, eventually it produces new seeds again. So these are seed to seed experiments and essentially encompass all of the um, steps in the development of the plant. Now, uh, Arabidopsis has also been good because there are many, many mutants available and also because uh, a lot of uh, molecular biology uh, has resulted in plants which uh, respond in many ways and can signal how they are responding uh, through a molecular events. And these molecular events are usually linked to a reporter of the event. And that reporter is usually a fluorescent protein, which glows green or purple or red, depending upon what the protein is. And I believe, and Kareem can talk to you more about this, the chamber is equipped with uh, a way of being able to visualize uh, these green fluorescent proteins. So uh, in, in, the, in the first round of experiments, we haven't uh, built out that hardware and software capability okay. yet, but we're, we're looking to add that. Okay, software. all right. So this is something to look forward to. But I think the point of Arabidopsis using it is this is a plant which uh, is a very contemporary plant, is used in most uh, plant molecular biology labs. And uh, for those of you who are aware of some of the new technology coming up called CRISPR, which involves actually editing the genetics of the genome of the plant, it's probably likely that the uh, application of that technique will first be to plants and it'll be to agriculture. And so I think getting students interested in Arabidopsis and in the molecular biology in Arabidopsis actually positions them well for a lot of future careers that are going to be coming up. The other thing I wanted to mention to you, just to keep in mind, is that of all the, the life events which have uh, influenced the, the evolution of life on Earth, probably the one that has remained most constant is gravity. Uh, the photoperiod, that is the amount of light coming uh, to the surface of the Earth has changed, the uh, number of hours of light have changed, the quality of light has changed, but gravity has remained relatively constant. And so all organisms have evolved under this 1G or close to 1G sort of environment. And as a result, there are many questions you can ask with regard to uh, the removal or microgravity, which is not total removal of gravity from the life cycle of an organism and ask how it does influence it. And this is probably very important with regard to long-term uh, trips uh, say to Mars, where you're going to be without a gravitational field for a long time, uh, how does that influence the development? And in the case of plants, just as an aside, and I won't go on to this at length, what we find is that the um, chemicals, the structure which actually gives the plant support on Earth in a microgravity environment actually lessens because the plant does not uh, need to have so much structural support. And so these are the kinds of experiments that students can run easily just with regard to microgravity to say nothing of changing the quality of the light or looking at molecular events. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna stop there. I could go on probably for too long, <laughs> but I'll stop there and I'll uh, be glad to answer any questions or continue a discussion if you'd like. We're all looking at each other. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so this is a, it's like a module then that is available for classes or for students to kind of conduct these investigations? Yes, and so I guess what's important to break down is, yes, a student can build, design and build their own experiments, uh, but there is usually a significant length of time and cost, or it's in a competitive environment, the likelihood of actually getting that experiment flown is low. What we wanted to do is to remove those, that friction that, as we saw it, and to have as many students experience uh, these types of uh, experiments and hopefully opening up to many different types of experiments by running one experiment. So we have one that's a, a set and it's doing something very specific and then opening up a platform in the classroom. So this, the Excel lab I have here on the table is what the classroom gets. The unit space is the same volume, uh, but it's a, a solid aluminum box and it has different venting systems and what have you but the lighting conditions are the same. 
Uh, one thing uh, Tony had up there an illustration briefly where it showed like a red side and a blue side. That's just an extreme example. The, the chamber is bifurcated in two sections. And I didn't bring the tubes here, unfortunately, but you grow them in tubes when you're at that stage. And on one side, you'll have it paired identically to the space station. It's on the same cycle of light, the same wavelength of frequency, um, and, uh, and the nutrients and everything, the, the um, ecotype is the same. And on the other side, you have an opportunity to create some variables. So you might just you know, try something with light, uh, or you may actually change the medium in which we're, we're growing the plants. And Professor, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the agar gel and, and why that's used versus, say, just water or, or some other types of systems? Uh, I'm not sure that I can tell you why it's used, but uh, from my previous experience, one has to keep in mind that in a microgravity environment, you're not going to – water is – liquid would not be very suitable because it would float all over the place. So on Earth, even though we have gravity, we naturally grow – seeds of these organisms on agar and uh, this is a solid medium most of you have had some familiarity with something like it in jello and uh, that particular medium has in it then the chemicals that we need for the plant to grow uh, it is uh, a medium and we haven't decided we've talked about this how we're going to give it to the students it's a medium which can or cannot contain sugar if it has sugar in it we have contamination problems but uh, i think we can overcome that by doing it slightly differently, but the composition of the medium is very well known and allows you then, your students in particular, to be able to vary the composition of the medium by including or excluding a certain of the important uh, elements that plants need to grow.